Praise the Lord. We are going to continue our verse-by-verse study of the book of Genesis. We are presently in chapter 24, and we will pick up from verse 11. Verse 11 of chapter 24 of the book of Genesis. Praise the Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here another time in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. Lord, as we gather in the sanctuary, Father, we commit ourselves into your hands. We pray, Father God, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, even as we open up your holy words today, O God. Pray our hearts will be prepared. We pray, O God, for pure hearts, O God, clean hands and pure hearts, even as we discuss your words today. Pray that the word of God will bring healing, will bring conviction upon us, dear Father. Help us, O God, Lord, to become hungry and thirsty for your word. Those who are on their way, bring them safely. We ask these favors in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Praise the Lord. All right, we are continuing our study of the book of Genesis. And in chapter 24, uh, uh, we pick up from verse 11. And it says, And he made his camel to kneel down without the city by a wall, by a well of water, sorry, at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. Now, remember in our last um, study, we talk about um, Abraham, Abraham sending his servant, his uh, most trusted servant of his household, sending him out to um, select. Uh, a bride for his son Isaac. Now Abraham was getting close to the time when he was going to die. As the Bible said that um, he, he walked in age. He was stricken in age. And uh, I guess he thought that he was going to die, but he was going to live another 37 years. But he was making preparation. He was making preparation for um, Isaac because the promise that God gave to him that his descendant is going to become numerous like the stars of the heaven and the uh, sand upon the seashore was going to be fulfilled in Isaac. So Abraham wants to select or make sure that Isaac or his son have a bride so that the promise can be fulfilled. We study where the servant, he loaded up ten camels and uh, he headed to Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the, the, where Abraham came from, and uh, uh, Abraham wanted him to go back to Mesopotamia, where he came from, back to the old country, and to get a wife for his son. Because Abraham did not want Isaac to get a, a wife from Canaan. He did not want him to get a wife from the Canaanite um, women. He wanted a wife from his old country. And we discussed all of that last week. So the um, servant of Abraham, he head out to Mesopotamia, which was approximately 450 miles away from the land of Canaan. And he head to Mesopotamia, and he go to the, the, onto the city of Nehor. Now that city, Nehor, uh, as I said last week, it was probably named after Abraham's grandfather, or maybe um, Abraham's brother, who also was Nehor, because Abraham's grandfather's um, name was Nehor, and also Abraham had a brother who was Nehor. So when he come to the city of Nehor, and the Bible tells us in verse 11, and he made his camel to kneel down without the city by a, wa- a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. So keep in mind that this servant, he went out to select a bride for uh, Abraham's son, Isaac. And what he's doing, he locates himself or he positions himself in the spot where women congregate. And in those days, where the women congregate, they used to congregate at the well. Uh, It was at the well that um, there's a few people in the Bible who found, who met their their, their bride at the well. Anybody know anybody in the Bible who met their bride at the well? Anybody? 
Any, you know anybody in the Bible who met their wife at the, at the well? Okay. Yeah, uh, Moses. Moses met his wife at the well. Also, anybody else? Uh, uh, Jacob. Jacob met his wife at the well. So the well was the place where the women will hang out. Where they will go to the well because um, according to what we have seen here, this well was outside the city wall. It was a distance away from uh, the homes of the people. So what the women will do uh, in the afternoon time when they finish all of their, their work in the house, they will um, gather together and they will head out um, to go to the well to get water. And they will do it in, 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 a, in, in, a, in company because they want to protect themselves. They don't go alone. They go in a group. And you know how women are. They like to chat and they like to talk. And that was the time that they used to discuss and they talk about different things that they want to talk about. So um, I guess in those days, that was the, the place. If you want to find a, a wife, you want to find a bride, going to the well was the place you want to go. And here we see that this servant of Abraham, this was a man of wisdom. And he knew that, you know, these women, they will be hanging out at, you know, the well. So he, he positioned himself in the, the place where uh, these women will be meeting. He said, even the time that women go out to draw water. Praise the Lord. He go to the, the spot, go to the well, and he was there in the evening time when he knew these women were coming out to draw water so that he can um, take a look at them and see if any one of them is a uh, prospect or to become a bride of his master, uh, Abraham, uh, son. In verse 12, and he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham. Here we see that this guy... He's a servant, and he's doing the bidding of Abraham. Remember in the um, early part of the chapter, we saw where he make, Abraham make him take a pledge, put his hand under his tie, and make a pledge that he was going to um, get a wife from his people, from his family. And he, he swore, he made a, a, an oath, take an oath that he was going to... Um, Get a wife for Isaac, not from Canaan, but from Abraham's homeland. So here we see that this servant was a trusted man. And he was doing everything that Abraham asked him to do. He was committed to um, his master. And he said, oh Lord God of my master Abraham. So here, this guy, he's praying, but he's praying in the name of Abraham towards Abraham God. He's praying... Uh, to God, but he's praying in Abraham's name. You know, like today we pray in the name of Jesus to God the Father. He was praying in the name of Abraham. And the reason for that is because this man, it seems as though Abraham had such an influence on the life of this servant. It seems like Abraham set such an example before him. He trusted him. And uh, it is believed that... Um, Abraham was the, the man or the person that lead this man to know God. Abraham, you know, ministered to him and become a witness to him. And it had to be because of Abraham, this man developed a relationship with the Lord. So he, he, the, the, the servant is praying and he's praying in the name of Abraham towards his God. In, uh, o Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. This is a good prayer for all of us to um, do at the starting of every day. Pray that God give us good speed. That God give us direction. God give us guidance. You know, I know we live in Canada and a lot of us, we say how busy we are here. And a lot of times, you know, we get up in the morning we go to bed late at night and then we have to go back out in the morning, go to work. And sometimes we just get up just in the nick of time to make it out, rush out the door. And a lot of times we don't spend time, you know, seeking the Lord, asking for guidance and direction. But we have to make sure 
we have to make sure that we have time to acknowledge the Lord. Before you leave your house, when you get up in the morning, you've got to spend some time with the Lord. You know, if it means that you have to cut back on whatever you have to do during the night time, go to bed a little bit earlier so that you can wake up at five, ten minutes, you know, you can put in with the Lord and seek God's guidance. The Bible said in all of our ways we must acknowledge Him, for He will direct our pathway. We need direction in our pathway. We can't be too busy. Doesn't matter what we have going on in our lives, we can't be too busy to, you know, spending some time um, with the Lord. And uh, this servant, he was praying and he asked in God for guidance. Uh, he says, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. See, I, I think there's about maybe uh, 18 times in this narrative that this servant is making mention of um, his master Abraham. He was not representing himself. He was representing Abraham. And you know, you know, there's a good example here for us. Those of us who are Christian, those of us who are born again, it shows that just like how this servant was not representing himself, he was representing his master. we supposed to represent our master. we supposed to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we are servants. And he is our master. And we need to declare him. You know, we need to, you know, let self be moved out of the way. And we declare Jesus. We represent Jesus to the world. We're not supposed to um, represent ourselves or promote ourselves. You know, sometimes you hear people preaching or they're, they're testifying or whatever they might be doing and they're promoting themselves. We're supposed to promote, promote one person and one person alone. All the glory belongs to Jesus. We must live lives, as the Bible says, we must let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Praise the Lord. And uh, this servant is setting a, a great example in the sense that he was seeking God. He's out on a mission. And I guess this is the first time he is undertaking such a mission, and he wants to please his master. He wants everything to be successful, so he is praying. He's seeking God's guidance. He's seeking the Lord so that the Lord can um, prosper his um, going. And here he continued talking to the Lord. He said, Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. So he said, Lord, I'm praying in the name of my master Abraham. You know I'm here to um, seek out a wife for my master's son. And here I am where the women of the city are, where they associate. They come out to draw water. They are right here. In other words, he said, God, they are right here. I'm seeking a wife and there's a lot of women here right now. But I don't know which one is the right one. <laughs> and I'm asking for guidance. I'm asking for direction. And uh, he is going to um, uh, put out some requirements. Or he is going to more or less like lay out, uh, lay out a, a fleece. As uh, in the book of Joshua. Remember when jo uh, not Joshua. In the book of Judges. Remember when um, Gideon was called to lead the children of God, the um, Midianite people, they were taking advantage on Israel. And when the Israelites, when they plant their crops, the Midianites will come up with their armies and they will, you know, take their crops and uh, they will bring up all of the animals and they will graze it on all of the produce of the Israelites. You know, and the Israelites will have to run away. They have to go and hide in the caves and stuff like that. I remember, remember when the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, Oh, mighty man of God. Call Gideon mighty man of God. And Gideon said to him, I'm paraphrasing, If I'm a mighty man of God, why is the Midianites taking advantage on us? And, you know, if you read on, you will see where Gideon was chosen 
by God to um, deliver Israel. And Gideon wasn't sure. So what he did, he put on a fleece. He got a piece of um, um, rug and uh, he put it out and he said, God, I'm going to put out this piece of rug and uh, if there is um, Jew, you know, in the night, Jew falls and he wants uh, Jew to fall all, all over. And uh, the piece of rug had to stay dry. He put in it to a test. Say, Lord, if, if you really want me to leave Israel, when we come the next, or when I come the next morning, it must have Jew right around. And this piece of rug must be still dry. And the Lord did it. Went out and exactly what he asked for, that was what happened. But he wasn't satisfied. So he turned it around. And he said, Lord, I want, instead of the, 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 the Jew fall all around, I want, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the Jew must fall and uh, all around. And uh, did I use dry before? What was? And, and no, I, I, I want uh, the rug itself, the rug itself to be wet. Amen. Amen. And the, all around must be dry. But the rug itself must be wet. Uh, I hope I'm putting it right. It's a long time I haven't go back over that text. But anyway, the Lord fulfilled all of the requirements that Gideon was asking about. So this is what this servant of Abraham was doing here. He was setting out, just like how Gideon set out a fleece for God to um, make fulfill certain requirements. This is what he was doing. And it said in verse um, 14, And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camel drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So here we see that the servant, he's setting out a requirement. In other words, he's putting a test. He's putting out some requirements here. And he's telling the Lord, you know, if this person is going to be the right person, they have to fulfill um, those requirements. One of the requirements is that this damsel or this young woman, when she come out, she, he's going to ask her for some water. And she's going to offer to give him water, uh, which was a common practice in the, you know, that part of the world. Um, hospitality was something that you know, everybody you know, participated in. In that part of the world, people are very kind towards strangers. And offering somebody water is not anything out of the ordinary. But here we see that this man, he didn't just want water. He was going uh, a step further. He said that after he asked for the drink of water, um, she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camel drink also. So you remember from the uh, earlier part of the text that we were uh, talking about the servant, he loaded up how much? Ten camels. He loaded up ten camels, and uh, he headed out to Mesopotamia. And here we are seeing that he's saying, that this girl, when she come out, whoever she is, he wants her to offer him a drink. And after offering him a drink, she must offer to water all of his camels. Now, I don't really, i never seen a camel. But according to what I read about camels, camel on, when they go on a long journey, a camel can drink from uh, up to uh, 24, 25 gallons of water. And some of them might even drink more. Some people say up to 40 gallons of water one camel can drink. And here this man has 10 camels. And he's expecting this woman who is going to be the wife of his master's son to offer him a drink of water and she will go a step further by offer to give water to, four, uh, uh, to 10 camels that can drink approximately 25 gallons of water. And, you know, this is, this is a tall order. It's a tall order. And uh, what I'm seeing here 
is that this servant, he is looking for a bride, looking for a woman who is going to make an investment in the relationship. This woman has to make an investment in the relationship. He is looking for somebody who is going to give up themselves. Somebody who is going to be caring to other people. Somebody who is going to be willing to invest themselves in the relationship. And, you know, relationship is like an investment, you know. When, you, when you're in a relationship, when you are married to somebody, it's an investment. And you have to put your time, you have to put your prayer, you have to put your, your patience, you have to put, you know, your long suffering. You have to put everything that you have into this relationship. Not just women, everybody, the man and the woman, both have to invest in the relationship. It's like you investing on the stock market or you investing in GIC or you investing in mutual funds. You know, sometimes you invest in mutual funds or whatever GIC you invest in in the market, and sometimes your financial advisor, they will send you a um, statement, and they will tell you, don't even look at the statement, the market is down. Market is down, don't even look at the statement, you're not going to see any kind of a increase on the statement. Yes, don't expect anything. And you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they will say, just, you know, disregard the statement. And you know, as I said, Relationship or marriage is an investment. And you know, sometimes you invest in it. But sometimes you're not seeing anything. You're not seeing, like you're not seeing any return. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like the um, uh, advisor, the financial advisor said, you know, don't throw, uh, put the statement aside, but don't cancel um, the, 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 the investment. You know, and it's the same thing too. A lot of times we invest in our relationship and it seems as though there's no return. But you can't cancel it. You can't throw it away. You need to be patient. You need to be patient because sometimes, you know, uh, um, just like how, you know, um, in a physical investment, it might be times when there is no yield, there is no um, increase. There are times in a relationship it seems as though you're not really seeing anything. It seems as though things are working out. You're not seeing any profit. But we need to hang in there. Praise the name of the Lord. And you know, I think a lot of, a lot of us, when we enter a relationship, we expect things to be good every day. You know, you remember when you were dating? You were dating your husband, dating your wife. You know, man, it was lovey-dovey. Everything was so good. That woman couldn't do nothing wrong. That man couldn't do anything wrong. Everything he do was just right. Amen. You know, everything she do was right. Every word that she said was just in line. You know, and a lot of times we expect when we get into the marriage, you know, things will continue that way. But a lot of times it don't continue that way. Most of us, we don't show our true colors. Who sing that song? True colors. Who's that? Yeah. Amen. Anyway, <laughs> I see a true color shining. Sometimes um, we don't really show our true colors when we get into the relationship. You know, because when you're courting, you don't really show your bad faults to your, 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 your spouse. You know, because you want to you, you pull the fish in. You throw out your line. And, uh, you know, you, you put your best bait on it. And you want the fish to take the bait. And, you know, when the fish take the bait, and it's a different thing. It's a different thing when you get into the actual relationship. And when you get into the actual relationship, especially those of us who are Christian, we are born again. Even though it didn't turn out the way how you was expecting it, God still expects you to stay committed in that relationship. Because, you know, I want to tell you that the, the, the strongest thing in a relationship is not love. And the most important thing in a relationship is not love. Sometimes you're in a relationship and it seems as though your love kind of 
it kind of wean. It kind of become like it's not there in full force anymore. Uh, well, thank you, brother. The love like you're getting cold, you're getting weak. It's not a sign that you need to give up. No, because, you know, sometimes that happens. And when, even though the love might be getting cold and the love might be getting weak, that is not the strongest point in the relationship. The strongest point or the strongest link in the relationship is not love. Even when it seems as though you don't have any love because of the fact that you already make a commitment. The commitment is the strongest link in the relationship. And even when it seems as though love not flowing, sparks not flying, amen, <laughs> you still have a commitment. You have a commitment and you have to keep that commitment. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when our love grow cold, if we stick it out and we pray and we seek God and we communicate with each other, it's going to come back again. The fire is going to blaze back again. Amen. Amen. You need to get down like how we used to do in St. Vincent. We roast in breadfruit and you light your fire. Sometimes, the, you know, the fire goes down. You get down on your knees and you start to blow. You get rid of the ashes and the stuff like that. You clean it out. Amen. Put some new wood on the fire. Amen. Get it going again. Because you have a commitment. So what I'm saying here is that the summer of Abraham was looking for a bride who would make an investment in the relationship. And the, because this is a great investment that she's making there because she, she, um, this woman has to give up a lot of her time. Because he's expecting her, he's expecting her to give water to ten camels. I think that was a lot. That, that, that was really too much. <laughs> 200 gallons of water if they're drinking, what, 25? And the thing is, in those days, the well, where the well was uh, situated, the well was down in, it's like a, you got to climb a step to go down. It's like it's down in the ground, but it might be down maybe 10, 15 feet in the ground. So you have to climb down in the, 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 the ground and dip the water, and then you come back up. So it's not an easy job. Anyway, we continue uh, where we are in verse uh, 14. So uh, it said, And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camel drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So here he set out, he put out that test. He put a test out, and he want this test to be fulfilled. And he said, if this test is fulfilled, then he is going to know that this woman is the person that was appointed. He used the word there, appointed, for uh, the, thy servant Isaac. So the question is, does God have a special man appointed for a woman? Does God have a special woman appointed for a man? If you're a Christian, you're not married, is there a special man God has for you? Should you have to be looking out for that special man? God created a special man for you. And if you don't get that man, if you don't get that man, you can't marry to no other man. Is there a special man? Can any man, any Christian man become a good husband? Can any uh, Christian woman become a good um, Christian wife? Brethren, there is no special husband for any one of us, for any um, Christian. There is no special wife for any Christian man. Any born again person, any born again Christian man can make a good husband. Any born again Christian woman can make a good wife. What we have to do when we seek in a wife, we seek in a husband, we need to do a lot of praying. We need to seek God. We have to, yes, you have to look for um, uh, the, the kind of a characteristics 
that you're looking for in an individual. You have to pray. You have to know what you're looking for. Just like if you're shopping. You're shopping. I remember when I was shopping. When I was shopping, what, 40 years ago. <laughs> I was shopping and um, me and my brother led us to living together in a room in Trinidad. And I, I always a praying person. And I'm praying, you know, because he's, the both of us sleeping on one bed. We have one bed that we're sleeping on. And, you know, he's there lying down. And I'm there, I'm praying. And I, I'm a person, I like to pray out. And I pray and I said, Lord, I, I want you to send me the right person. I'm praying that you will send me this right person when the time comes. And lo and behold, my brother, he, he lied down there and he listening and played as if he ain't paying no attention. You know, next thing you know, he gone down at church, and all the guys that we hanging out with, boy, I hear him praying, you know, and every praying, and he's saying, Lord, send me the right one. And you know, in Trinidad, <laughs> in Trinidad, people like to tease one another. <laughs> then they start calling me, Lord, send me the right one. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really mind, because I pray, and I pray and ask God to send me the right one. And lo and behold, I'm still with that right one, even now. And, you know, it's getting close to, 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 to 40 years, getting, coming up there. So, you know, when we're looking for a wife, we're looking for a husband, you've got to look for somebody who's born again. How, how can you know if somebody's born again? How can you know if somebody really loves the Lord? You know, a lot of times you look at a, a, a person in church, and they look so sanctified, you know. They look like they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They might even be speaking in tongues. But is it real? You've got to test it out. You've got to really see if that person really loves the Lord. You've got to see if that person really wants to make a sacrifice. You know, see the way how that person um, attends church. See if that person is a praying man or a praying woman. You've got to see if that person likes studying the Word of God? Does that person have an interest in the Word of God? You know, does that person easily upset? You know, you say to him, oh, I don't think you're born again, you know. The best way to try somebody to know if they're born again, say to them, you know, the way how you're acting, I don't think you're born again, you know. If that person becomes upset and get angry and get in a huff and a puff, and say, how can you say I'm not born again? I know I'm born again and stuff like that. And that person starts becoming angry and stuff like that. That is the way you can test that person to know if they're truly born again. But if you say to somebody, you know, I don't think you're born again. You know, the way you're living, you're not, you don't like you're born again. And they say, well, God is my judge. And, you know, if you say so, what can I do? Um, God is the one that I am serving. And that person takes that in a spirit of humility. You know, then you can know that, you know, this person um, has some kind of connection with God. If you see this person like to pray, they like to spend time with the Lord, and it's not just with the both of you, you know, they like to come over to your place and say, I'm going to come over to your room, I'm going to come over to your apartment, and we're going to have a prayer meeting. We're not talking about that. You know, they're having prayer in church, Bible study, and this person interested in coming to Bible study, you know, he has an interest in these kind of things. We've got to look at some of these things, you know. And then we can make our decision. So, um, he said, And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So, if all of those things fall in line, the servant is saying he's going to know that God has shown kindness to his master. Listen, God didn't have to show no kindness to Abraham. God don't owe us anything yet. I want us to understand this. Even though... We accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And God chose not to um, prosper us. He chose not to fulfill all the dreams and all of your expectations that you might have. God will still remain God. Hallelujah. God doesn't change. And God don't owe us anything. God don't have to do nothing for us. Everything God do for us is a bonus. It's a plus. You know, God has already provided salvation for us. And if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you have other situations in your life, for instance, you might be sick, or you might uh, need a job, or whatever, 
I know God is a good God, He's a loving God, He's a good Father, He's kind to us. But God will have any obligation to heal us. I know it, I know it sounds strong, but God is not under any obligation to heal us. If you are sick as a child of God, and you don't get healed, you can't point your finger at God. You're not supposed to do that. Get upset and get angry because you're not healed. You know, you're looking, you have expectation to get this big house, big mansion, you know, uh, with the picket fence around it, and that's not fulfilled. God will have to give you that. God is not under any obligation to do these things. Praise the name of the Lord. Yes, He will do it from time to time if it's a part of His will. But if it's not a part of His will, brethren, and He chose not to do it, we, we, we don't have any say in it. We don't have any say in the matter. Praise the Lord. But the Lord chose to be kind to um, Abraham. And it was 15. And it came to pass before he had done speaking. So you remember he was praying and he was setting out these requirements for this lady to fulfill. And even before he finished prayer, um, before he said before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebecca came out. Before the prayer was even ended, Rebecca came out. You know, sometimes we complain and we say, oh, you know, God takes so long to answer my prayer. I don't know, I'm praying for so long and it seems as though there is no answer. It's like my prayer just going, <laughs> hello, how are you? <laughs> my prayer just going up and hitting the ceiling and falling down back. But there are times when God can... Answer our prayer, you know, in a snap, in a, in a quick time. And sometimes the Lord answer, we pray and the Lord answer our prayer. And sometimes you have, a, you have a prayer about something and then it comes to pass and you're kind of shocked. You're kind of surprised. It happened in the Bible too, you know. I remember when Peter was in prison and uh, um, the Lord sent the angel and the angel led Peter out of jail. And then uh, I think it was in Mark. Um, Mark, John, Mark, mother, house, the saints of God was having a prayer meeting for God to release Peter. And the Lord released Peter out of jail while they were praying. And while they were praying, Peter go by the door where they were praying, having the prayer meeting and knocked the door. And a damsel came by the door and saw Peter, went back inside and tell him, Peter is outside. God, Jesus already released Peter. They said, no, no, it can't be, it can't happen. God has already here and answer and release Peter from prison. But they, they didn't believe because it, I guess it was too quick. So sometimes God will answer our prayer in a quick time. And sometimes it could be a long time. You know, sometimes it could be like Abraham. Abraham wait for 24 years. Abraham wait for 24 years before the promise of a son was given to him by Sarah. Also, Isaac, Abraham's son, he is going to wait also for 20 years before the promise of a, 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 a child will be given to him. Brethren, sometimes things that we pray for, it might not be fulfilled. There are people who pray for certain things and uh, it never fulfilled while they are alive. It happened to people in the Bible. The Bible talks about people who are praying about certain things and they die before without these things being fulfilled. And there are people who we probably might know who pray about things and those things never um, come to pass while they're alive. You don't know of anybody who used to pray about um, getting their children saved. They have unsaved sons and unsaved daughters. Mothers praying for their daughter to get saved. And they live all their life and nothing never happened. And they passed away and maybe a year, two years after they passed away. You see these children just coming to the Lord one after the other. Never fulfilled during their time when they was alive. But God bring it to pass. So brethren, the reason for that, why we have some prayers are answered quickly and some prayers seem like they are delayed, is because God is in charge. God is sovereign. If you are in charge, you are going to answer your prayer as quick as possible. 
But because we are not in charge, we have to wait on Him. And the Bible said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It says, praise God. Um, and it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to uh, Bethuel, son of, Mil- uh, of Milcah, uh, the wife of Nehor, Abraham's brother, with her picture upon her shoulder. So here we see that um, he's given us the um, family um, heritage or genealogy here of um, Rebecca. He said that Rebecca, she was born to Bethuel, Bethuel, son of Milka. Milka, if you remember earlier part when we were studying in Genesis, Milka is the sister of Lot. Remember when Abraham was leaving um, all of the Chaldee to go to the promised land? Um, it was uh, Abraham had Lot, and Lot had a sister. Abraham took Lot with him, and Abraham's sister, who was Milka, she stayed with Abraham's brother Nahor. And after a while, Nahor married to Milka. Nahor married to Milka, and Milka and Nahor produce um, uh, Bethuel. So um, Rebecca is granddaughter to um, Milka and Nehor, Abraham's brother. And it said that with her picture upon her shoulder, she came out with the picture upon her shoulder. She go into the well to draw water. And you know what I'm seeing is that people back in that time or women back in that time was hard working. They used to work hard. And it seems as though in every society, women used to be working real hard. And when you look at some of those uh, places, even places today, you will see how most women, it seems as though they work harder than men. Yes, women seem to be carrying the, 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 the greater burden, the heavier load where working is concerned. I remember when I was growing up in St. Vincent, you know, in my area where they have all of those plantations. And you will see the women going out in the morning time. They have their hoe. Anybody here know what's a hoe? <laughs> they have their hoe on their shoulder. And they're going out and they give them a task. Sometimes they go out and their task is to dig our root. They have to dig up, plow up our root. And they're going out with their hoe and they have their big bamboo basket. Pick up the arrow root stuff is inside it. I think they used to get paid sometimes by the basket and you have to plow up that field and get the arrow roots or the ground nuts out. And you see these women, they'll go and they work and they're coming back home. You know, and then they will go back home. When they go back home, some of them, they have to go home and they, they have to go to their own garden, their own piece of ground where they have their stuff plant and go and work there again and then come home and then, you know, see about... Um, looking to fix up dinner for their family. And then you see the guys, you know, they go out to work too, but they come back home and they will uh, maybe get a shower, get cleaned up. You know, they put on their, um, <laughs> their hula hoop <laughs> or they wash their feet and they walk out to the, um, to the, to, to, to the rum shop. And you see the, those guys out there hanging out and they're drinking. Some of them playing draft, they're playing roll me, they're playing all kinds of sports. And the heavier load of the work um, is rest on the shoulders of the women. But I guess we can thank God today that things, things seem to change. Yes. Well, um, that, I, I, think, um, I think that was, that was before. I think, I think uh, it, it's kind of changing now kind of changing now. I'm telling you right now, if you have a, a woman in your life, if you have a wife in your life that is hard working, say thank God for that. Give God time. If you have a wife that is committed and hard working, cleaning, washing and whatever, cooking, you know, looking after the children, looking after you and stuff like that, 
Man, you have to say thank God and you have to cherish that woman. You have to treat that woman like a queen. And if you have a husband, if you have a husband that is committed to you, committed to the family, and doing things that a husband's supposed to do, you have to thank God for that, that man. Because that kind of man hard to find. And that kind of woman, the woman that we're talking about here who is committed and dedicated and hardworking, is hard to find. I'm not knocking women, but I'm telling you, most women today are not really hardworking. Like what we see, um, example that we have, you know, growing up, you know, we see women hardworking and they're doing this and they're doing that. You know, a lot of women today, and uh, not only women alone that is not hardworking, a lot of men, that is, uh, they don't uh, believe in working hard either. So it's on both sides. But uh, yes, it's on both sides. You have a lot of lazy men out there too. Well, uh, <laughs> no, listen, listen. What I'm talking about, I'm talking about in comparison to what we know about. We have to say, thank God today that things change. There's a lot of women today, and a lot of men too. There's a lot of women today that is not really hard working, and you can't tell them about, about working hard. I listen to some guys, and I'm not taking side of anybody. You'll hear some guys, some guys, even where I'm working. Some guys, they will get up um, 5.30 to come out to work. And they come out to work, and they do a hard work, you know, doing garbage work is hard work. Do that work, and their wife is at home looking after maybe the kid from two kids or one, whatever they have. And then these guys, they will go back home, and they will go back home, and they will still meet that wife on the bed. I know she has the kids to look after. Still meet the wife on the bed. And as soon as he reached back, I hear so many guys complain about that. As soon as he reached back from work, she expects him to take care of those kids. She turned the kids over to him. And he went out 5.30 to work, and she's at home. I know she's taking care of the kids. But as soon as he gets back home, the responsibility of the kids fall on him. And if he go and take a rest, take a, a half an hour sleep, you know, it's trouble in the house. And you will go out, you will come back, and there's no food. So what I'm saying is that, like how long ago, women of long ago, women of long ago, who are home taking care of the family, the husband go out to work, when he come back home, for sure he's going to have something to eat. But, you know, there's so many women these days that the husband go out and they come back home, and they're home all day, and there's no food. It's only, it's only few women today who really have that concern that if they know their husband go out to do something, do a job, and, and he's coming back home, they will, you know, go out of their way to um, clean up the place and, you know, prepare something for him to eat. That when he comes back home, he has something to eat. So that's what I'm saying. If you have one of those women in your life, if you have one of those women in your life who think about you in that way, and, you know, prepare for you. You need to cherish that person. If you have a man in your life, it's on both sides. If you have a man in your life who is concerned about family, because a lot, of man, a lot of men these days, they're not concerned about family. A lot of men these days are not concerned about family. They don't have no interest. Like how we have some men that we know that are dedicated to their family. They will die for their family. You know, their, their family come forth. You know, if they have uh, money and they have to spend some money, they will spend it on their family and they'll forget about whatever need they have in their life. You're not finding these men any, anymore. They're hard to find. I don't know, but if you have one, <laughs> if you have one, you need to take care. Take care of him. And, you know, I'm closing because it's true. And I know some of these truths are hard to, 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 to bear. But I hear so much complaint out there about women who just stay at home and they're on Facebook and they're on the internet. They become hooked on Facebook. You know, stay up late at night. Can't get them to go to bed. And they, you know, just texting and, you know, as soon as you hear the phone whistle, phew, 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 whatever the phone, you know that song the phone does make? <laughs> you hear that phone make that, that phew, phew, phew kind of a, a sound. Man, they jump on it. I'm telling you, listen, I'm, I'm never going to sleep in a bed with a woman who has no phone going to pick with you. Listen, if you, you have a phone, 
You gotta put it somewhere else. You not having no phone close to that bed, that bed. When time to sleep, we put away phone. Put away television. It's sleeping time. You know? And you hear so many men talking about, oh, my wife's still up all night on the phone, all night on Facebook, all night doing this. And then during the day, she can't do work. She had to stay home and sleep. So even though she had to take care of the kids, you know, when you come home, most of the responsibility is still going to go on you. You still got to go and do the laundry. Listen, we got to work together. We got to work together. If your husband is working and you are home, he's not supposed to come home and have to go and prepare dinner and have to go and do laundry and have to go and take care of the kids and all of these kind of things. You have to give him time to, to rest. And that is the reason why some of these men, they, they'll walk away from home. After a while, they become, they become so exhausted and they become tired. And there, there are some men, when they're living in these kind of conditions, they don't want to go home. You know, any kind of overtime, sometimes I see some guys at work and they, man, I tell you, they're searching all over for the supervisor. They want to get some kind of overtime. And sometimes there's no overtime and you just see they're just lingering around because they don't want to go home because they know what they're going to meet. Amen. We need to live good, brethren. And, you know, we work together. You know, we work together as a team. And we work together as a team. The Lord is going to bless us. We're going to end there for today. Um, yes. Pardon? But didn't, didn't, didn't you hear I put it on both sides? Well, I, I put it on both sides. I said that it have, it have lazy men out there, and also it have, it have with, because when I talk about lazy men, um, Sister Lewis, was it that you was objecting to? It, uh, no, it have, it have lazy men out there. It have, I said it have men out there who are not family, uh, family men. I even said it before. There are men out there that. They are not family oriented and you know, just like how it have women out there who not really dedicated to their family, it have men out there who are not dedicated to their family also. And I said, when if you have a woman that is dedicated to your family, a woman who is gonna you you gone out to work, who is gonna cook for you and have the house clean and do all of these kind of things, that is a woman you're supposed to cherish. And I said that several times. And if you have a husband who is committed to your family, you know, committed to you, who is going to put the family first, that is a man you're supposed to cherish. But, and I say it again, I'll say, I'm, saying, I'm saying it again. That kind of women is hard to find because the women, the kind of women that we have today, they don't want to go into that kind of mold. They don't want to be molded in that kind of way. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. I, 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 I said that. I said that. That kind of woman is hard to find. When something is hard to find, it doesn't mean it's not out there. It's not out there. And just like as I said, there's a lot of men who, they don't really care much about family. And just like we, you know, long ago we have men who care about their family. Finding men who really care and concern about their family. Who is going to put their family first. And, you know, their family come first, you know, and looking after their family. If you have that kind of man in your life, you're supposed to cherish him. And whoever decides to stay home. Some, some, in some homes, some homes, um, the woman might be making more money. And because she's making more money, they have two kids to see about. It is more expensive to put, it in, put the kids in daycare. Uh, so they let the husband, who probably might be making less money, he decides to stay home and take care of the kids. Or maybe it's on the other side where the man might be making more money and the woman stay home and take care of the kids. But the thing is, you know, if one person is at home, whoever is at home, staying home, they got to make sure that they, they take care of things home. And the person who coming home from work don't have to come home and still go and do everything. You see, listen, I'm not going to be talking with water in my mouth when I have to say anything. When I, got, when I got something to say, I know it's hard truth. And truth is always hard to bear. And we can't run away from truth. 
You know, and that's the reason why I'm trying to balance it, you know, what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to put, I'm not trying to put all the blame on women and saying women not doing this and women not doing that. But if we, yes, sister. Right. Right. Yes, no, give, give her the mic, give her the mic. No, but then there's, there's relationship yes. where both people are working. Right. And both people come home at the end of the day. And then the woman would do another round, you know, cook, clean, kids, homework. Mm -hmm. Right. The woman is taking the whole load. So there's that. There's woman who... You know, there's, there's, there's some woman who, if you make him more money mm. than your husband or whatever, he might choose, okay, he might stay home, whatever. But as you say, there are lazy women and right. there are lazy men. That doesn't want to work. Right. There's hard-working women that would go out and do their thing. But when they come home, they cut the slack. They just leave everything at home. Then there's a lady, like me, I would come home and do a full 12-hour with the kids, this, this, this. And at the end of the day, they go out and try to work. Right. Well, but you see, that's what, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say, and you just said it. That kind of woman, like how you describe yourself, who will go out and work and still come back home and do the work, that, that kind of woman hard to find. It, 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 that kind of woman hard to find because the, the, the average women that we have today, they rebel against that. They're not doing it. But there are those out there who are still doing it. And that's what I'm saying, that if you have one of those women... You have one of those uh, posts in your life. You have a wife like that, you know, who will do things like that. You, you got to cherish them and you got to treat them like a queen. And this is not to say that you don't have. And I said that they, they, they hard to find. They, they, and they're very hard to find. Because these modern day wives that we have out there, the things that, you know, wives, you know, 15, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you know, they used to do and, they, you know, do for their family and stuff like that. We're not having them things out there a lot anymore. It's hard to find these kind of women. And, uh, and, and on the other hand, too, it's hard to find those kind of men who will be dedicated and committed to their family. Like how we have men was, you know, dedicated and committed back there. It's hard to find these kind of men today, too. So it's on both sides. And I'm not trying to... Um, Hammer, you know, women. You know, the, the, thing, the thing about us in this church, in this church, anytime something say about the women, it seems as though we always feel that, you know, um, Pastor Duncan is siding on the men, men's side. Listen, if, if, if men is doing something that is wrong, I'm going to stand up and say what you're doing is wrong. I'm not a two-faced kind of person. I'm not a razor blade. I'm not cutting on both sides. If I see somebody doing something wrong, and I'm going to come out and say and the thing is about the truth, when the truth, when something is truthful, and when somebody can declare something that is truthful, if we look at it and it falls in our ground and you are guilty of something that the person is saying, you know, it doesn't matter how he say it, you're supposed to make benefit of it. And that is what we are here to do. The Lord bless us. We will stop there for today. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your people. God, I pray that you continue to heal our marriages, heal our relationship. Teach us how to love one another. Teach us how to walk in love. Bless us as we go forward. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name.